Thanks, Jess. It's an honor to be here and not to be at a mega church wearing this headset. So, <laughs> luckily. Um, this was the most dreadful <laughs> part I imagined that I would have this apparatus on my face. Anyway, um, the privilege of ordinary heartbreak. It's an epigram from one of my favorite poets, um, Stephen Dunn's, uh, one of his poems. Um, I don't remember the title of the poem, but you know, I think we all have the experience of latching on to a phrase we wish we had written, and somehow we're trying to repeat it to ourselves, hoping <laughs> that maybe it will come out of us in some really natural way, as if it was from inside us. So I've, I've carried this phrase, and. Um, and realize over time that words can sometimes be like fantasies, right? That if you kind of repeat them enough to yourselves, they happen, they come true in some way. And then you spend another lifetime trying to figure out what to do with that power or that curse. Um, and if I weren't interested in words, I do not know what I would be doing studying politics. And, and that's sort of where my being lies. So, so this story, this beginning short story, is from my recent trip uh, back to Pakistan, where, which is home for me. Um, and I happened to be awake at a fairly unfortunate hour of 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. Unfortunate for an insomniac, because you're almost out of the time where you could fall asleep while it's still dark, right? And in a place like Karachi, where, uh, you know, this is also sort of on the... Um, you're also approaching the time for the morning call for prayer, uh, the Fajr prayer, which the call that even if you, you, you fail to follow the call to prayer, you do not fail to fall into this sort of strange chasm, this portal into a whole series of intensities and memories and, 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 and feelings um, that, of course, you remember from all these moments of your childhood and growing up lying in the same room with seven, with seven doors and one window and, and, and trying really hard how to convey what that feeling is to the person lying next to you who you have committed your life to and you were in love with but you do not know how to translate the meaning of that poetry that's going on in your head and that will remain my biggest, biggest um, failure. But the point being that there's something about that heartbreak that I realized that morning that it, it wasn't nostalgia only. It wasn't, I was home, so how could it be just nostalgia? It was something, something else, and it was, it was mildly indignant and almost resentful that I was at a place that taught me about how hearts break and taught me about how people live with, with suffering in a manner that's not suffering to to go to war against. We don't objectify suffering as an object to, to kill. We don't, um, we don't kill bills, but we also don't think about suffering as, as a thing out there that we go and render an evil and, and somehow just get to work um, on those, those things that are somehow other than us. There's something about suffering that I learned from being where I was and to see people struggling around me with no imminent end to that suffering, but at the same time, suffering not being the other to joy or to a notion of human fulfillment, that people struggle in those spaces all the time and in a way um, th that suffering doesn't become an object. So this heartbreak question was with this feeling that some, while I was there, I was surrounded by the sounds that, sound, that, that seemed so familiar to everything I hear on the TV here. The language was different, but every intonation was like you were listening to either MSNBC or Fox News. Every manner of talking about human life was fitted into an event cycle that somehow I had learned only in this country. And then you realize, that somehow some other form of homogenization is happening in the world. It's not only the export of, 
of, of cars and, and, and labor. It is the export of ways of suffering in the world. It is an approach to feeling. It is an approach to affect. And that is the only way one can imagine politics being something that, 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 <laughs> that, stri that is not a matter of governance or something that happens up there, but something that is on an everyday basis determining what you and I feel for, what you and I will die for, right? What we, you, and what you and I will want to live for. Um, so the question of heartbreak kind of became this, this thing that stuck in my head. And when I came back here, and any South Asian will tell you that it takes about three weeks to come back to normalcy. And so it isn't a matter of, um, it isn't culture shock in this, in this simple way. And it isn't this, the idea that somehow I want you to understand how different I am and accept my difference. What I'm trying to say is that Something about that transition is a transition to accept that my heart just breaks in more ways when I'm back home. And not because I love the people more or somehow they are more mine than everybody who I've lived and grown with in this country for the past 11 or 12 years, but there is an abundance of emotional provocation. People want you to respond emotionally. It's not an encroachment on someone to imagine somehow that you will ask them for an emotional provocation or want to respond in that way. And that somehow my world here, the range of emotions I can feel on a daily basis and the range of emotional provocations I can give to another person just, just shrinks. And, and, I've, and I I don't know what to do about that. So, so I have been writing on suffering and love for the imaginable adult life in this country. And, um, and I'm here bringing the question to you. What do you think heartbreak is? And what do you think it might have to do with politics? And my sense is that politics, if it is about anything, it is about who are heartbreaks for and why. Right? And not in some simple, mushy way. I'm not trying to write a Sweet Dreams novel here. Like, I'm really trying to get at a form of emotionality that is not horror. I mean, because we do associate lots of sentiments with politics, right? Look at what's happening on the TV now. I mean, th there's horror, there's fear, there's trauma, there's repulsion, Loudness. there's garrulity, there's just venom. <laughs> and, and, and then there is the ever-present a victim for whom our heart is always supposed to go out as long as they tell you their story, just so your heart can go out enough without making you feel complicit in anything that might have happened to them. So, so, so there's, there's a certain way that, that, that for me the question of this demand somebody can make on your emotion, and Professor Smolin mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm very privileged to be in the right sort of order of things, uh, having, uh, the day having been begun by uh, really noted speakers who've worked on this, but, but there's something else that happening in the world right now that we need to try to grasp, that's, and it, the given categories of thinking about empathy and sympathy and guilt and responsibility will just not work. Because the more we see a certain form of homogenization of how people's sufferings are interpreted, what meaning is given to them, how we regard their suffering as exchangeable or commodifiable or objectifiable, and because that somehow we all assume that people are working towards similar ends or that they are working towards a certain kind of encashment of their suffering, this assumption that it will somehow end and then things will be better, um, I think we are making a big mistake there. Well, so maybe I should ask you um, for another sort of imaginative journey, right? Um, let's imagine there's a museum called the Museum of Dead Suffering. Um, what would we find there? Maybe a memorial, right? We just, we had a lovely speech on that, you know, um, referred to the Holocaust. I'm thinking Auschwitz. We, we, we imagine... Um, what else do we imagine when we think of dead suffering? Perhaps, perhaps um, whenever a big disaster, like we know it, uh, gets translated into either statistics that make it a grand disaster, so it can sort of even register on our, on our screens, or when we respond to it by counting the number of 
dollars we, we texted to Haiti, right? There's a certain way that both of these measurements are mediating our relationship to that suffering that's out there, right? Uh, th there are other ways that we, we confront that suffering. Um, and I think that when we walk into that seeming, supposed museum, we might also find somewhere there <laughs> little cages named harm, injury, and pain, all things that have in some ways domesticated, right? This isn't anything other than domesticated, tamed life, right? Something that's been enclosed into things that maybe surround the, body, the, line, the outline of our body and that anything ex in excess of that seems to be unkempt, messy, something we won't go into, right? So, so we need a certain degree of clarity. We need a, a certain form of, and then we, we associate this, these injuries with people with histories of, of uh, with, with, with endless memories of enslavement or um, hurt and harm, and then we reduce the people to those injuries we can identify so that they can perform their sufferings for us over and over again and say those same things, and their visibility and their humanity in our, in our view will be reducible to that injury that we do know. So, at one point in the museum, they're going to tell you, well, I think you're in the wrong place. Go outside. Because you will find that suffering everywhere you go. Any moment where you ask somebody to tell you a story about their pain, any moment where that is the premise of your compassion for another, another person's performance or presentation of their own suffering in a certain manner, rather than you realizing that perhaps there's a role we have, not in necessarily creating the suffering, I'm not concerned about that in this moment, but in making suffering present in a certain way that we, that we end up becoming part of an economy that isn't only concerned about who suffers how much, Right? so that we can give people good health care and um, give them social security, but in what ways people suffer and how we produce those sufferings, not by being the white person who built the boat, who built, brought all the slaves, but we produce the suffering every day by making a demand on its presence in a certain manner. And it has everything to do with the sensual apparatus that our societies impose us the ways our sufferings and our pathos, our love and our pain are conscripted in the structures that want us to perform and behave in a certain way. So that being said, um, brings to mind the fact that perhaps with this dead suffering, like with any other kind of death, what would death mean if there wasn't life, right? If there wasn't, weren't you and I to bury someone? If there wasn't the, those who remember the dead, right? There have to be, even in these monuments of, of injury and pain and harm, there has to be living suffering somewhere, lurking around, right? Carrying the burden of the dead suffering, some of us have to do that more than others. Some of us cannot give up that burden too easily because it's written on our faces or it's branded on our arms, but still there is some life that happens that might be the, work, might be the place to look at in order to reconnect our hopes for the future. That not, let's not look at when we have already produced Haiti into the biggest disaster of history, but let's look at the living that allows that suffering to shame us, <laughs> given what is it that people live with and survive, and what forms of communities they create with nothing, right, where it isn't an, an identifiable, conceivable end to the suffering any time in the future. What is that relationship to time, to labor, to suffering that we do, we are completely here incapacitate, have no capacity for? That, that leads me to this cool guy, um, um, Karl Marx, who, who wrote about a similar thing, uh, but in relationship to labor. The fact that there is, a, that his problem is not that we don't get paid enough. Right? And that's what everybody's problem is, that they keep asking, you, using him to say, well, let's ask for a little bit more money for the slave. What he's saying is, there's something about our living being that gets put into the things we made that ultimately becomes a subtractive sort of 
feeling, a, a process that takes life away, puts into things, makes them into objects and commodities that are ultimately really dead, but then rule over us as if, they ha as if we have forgotten that their power came from everything we did. The same way with any ruler, any state. These are institutions we build with our livelihoods, with our life, with our vitalities, with our needs and powers and feelings, and then they roll over us as if there's no memory that somehow we were the ones who, who put it all in place. And so for Marx, the, the basic trick of capitalism or trying to get past it or trying to make it true to its name is to reclaim that life that we put into the things so that this this act of being involved in humanity and producing things is an act of, uh, that creates and produces life rather than death. And he's the one who actually calls capital dead labor, which is a sort of a very horrifying way to confront the question that we, feel we confront today in terms of capitalism. It isn't about lack. It isn't about, about being harmed by capital. It is a much more basic question of what happens to our humanity when we put, when we even cease to feel that what is at stake is our way, is our being human, rather than will I have this car um, when I uh, fire my broker. So, um, so, so that being sort of said, um, I just want us to think about the question of um, I want us to, to leave us with the idea that perhaps we need to look at the sensual economy, the political sensual economy of suffering in a way that allows us to see ourselves as producers of suffering and not merely as distributors and consumers and producers not in a way that takes us back to a guilt-ridden feeling of, of shame in the face of monumental suffering, but something that on an everyday basis, like Gloucester in, in King Lear, right? The ability to every act of sensual engagement in the world has to be an act of redemption in some way. And uh, to go back to the beginning of, of the talk, to heartbreak and to words and their fantasies, I might want to venture that when we go out in the world and try to remove suffering, let's ask not for suffering to be removed because that might make us less human or perhaps not human. Let's ask that the forms in which suffering exists now are the ones that pass and not suffering altogether so that we can actually grasp anew what it might mean, mean to suffer with and for another and ourselves. Thank you so much for having me.